Our scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, which is a New Testament reading. It's a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And I offer that um, because sometimes we read from all kinds of different books in the Bible and we have no idea. And somebody says, okay, we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 40. And you think, I have no, what, what was happening? <laughs> who were those people and who was speaking and who was Isaiah and what was the message? So I just like to orient us a little bit to our scripture passage before we read each week. But Romans chapter one uh, says this, God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodly behavior and the injustice of human beings who silence the truth with injustice. This is because what is known about God should be plain to them, because God made it plain to them. Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, because they were understood through the things God had made. So humans are without excuse. Although they know God, they didn't honor God as God or thank God. Instead, their reasoning became pointless and their foolish hearts were darkened. While they were claiming to be wise, they made fools of themselves. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images that look like mortal humans, birds, animals, and reptiles. And since they didn't think it was worthwhile to acknowledge God, God abandoned them to a defective mind to do inappropriate things. So they were filled with all injustice, wicked behavior, greed, and evil behavior. They are full of jealousy, murder, fighting, deception, and malice. They are gossips. They slander people, and they hate God. They are rude and proud, and they brag. They invent ways to be evil, and they are disobedient to their parents. They are without understanding, disloyal, without affection, and without mercy, Though they know God's decision that those who persist in such practices deserve death, they not only keep doing these things, but also approve others who practice them. So every single one of you who judges others is without any excuse. You condemn yourself when you judge another person because the one who is judging is doing the same things. We know that God's judgment agrees with the truth, and God's judgment is against those who do these kinds of things. If you judge those who do these kinds of things while you do the same things yourself, think about this. Do you believe that you will escape God's judgment? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. How many of you know someone who sins? We all know somebody who sins, right? It's it's nice reading Romans 1. I like that humility. She's pointing to herself. It's nice in reading Romans 1 that Paul says, well, they are wicked and they are deceivers, right? And they are murderers and they are slanderers. They, 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 they. They are pretty awful people if it sounds right, if we're hearing it, right? Right? All right. Uh, so this passage, when I read it, sounds a lot, or it reminds me a lot of the passage of the woman caught in adultery and the community brings her forward to be stoned because that was the appropriate punishment for adultery. And so everybody's there and they've got their rocks collected up and Jesus says, okay, they're ready, right? But she sinned. She's an adulteress. And Jesus says what? You who has not sinned may throw the first stone. You who has not sinned may throw the first stone. It, it feels like Paul's collected up an awful lot of stones, right? There's murder, there's lying, there's slander, there's all kinds of sinfulness, there's malice. I have a whole collection here of all the terrible things that people do, right? And, and I could probably just have buckets and buckets. I could give each of you some stones and you would be able to name some terrible, awful things that people have done because people do terrible, awful things, don't they? Yes. And one of the terrible, awful things that people do is they use this passage to throw 
stones. Anybody know somebody who's used this passage to throw stones? Well, you are wicked because you're here in this list. The church never does that, right? We know people who've done this. We've maybe even been guilty of doing this. We've picked up stones ready to name someone's sin. It's a part of our condition, and it's not just us in the 21st century. It's not for just us old people who were in the 20th century, right? As my child reminds me, well, you were in the 1900s. Uh, that makes us old, just so you know. Uh, and it wasn't just the 1800s or the 1700s, right? Paul wrote this to the first century church. The things that we struggle with today, they struggled with then. They were ready to throw stones, naming all kinds of awfulness that they were doing. So before we sort of dig in a little bit further, a little bit of orientation for the book of Romans, because we're going to be here for seven weeks, it is to the church in Rome, right? A letter written to the church in Rome. Rome is a metropolis, it is full of people who are diverse in languages, in country of origin, in perspective, in religious practices, in daily practices. Sounds like any modern day metropolis, right? Where you have lots of people, you have diversity. And Paul founded the church in Rome, and then he equipped some people to be pastors in the church in Rome. He said, okay, we got the church started. We know how to worship. We're learning about who Jesus was. We're practicing discipleship. All right, y'all, you are in charge now. And he leaves to go start another church. And so those pastors do their job, and church does what churches do. They start to fight with each other. Now, they had good reason to fight with each other because they were Diverse. Are we diverse? If we're diverse, then we know something about fighting with each other because that's what diversity begets. We have challenges reconciling some of our differences. It's just who humanity is. And the Roman church had different types of believers. And I want to clarify because sometimes we think, well, the church, so they were Christians. The first century church was not a category of Christians because Christianity as a religion was not yet formed. They were Christ followers, but they, weren't, they wouldn't have said, I'm a Christian. Does that distinction make sense? And there were Jewish Christ followers, people who were born Jewish, raised in the Jewish tradition, came to who, hear who Jesus was and what he had done and said, I want to follow that man. So I'm going to join that church, but still considered themselves Jewish. They were just Jewish Christ followers. And then not Jew is what? Gentile, right? It's like trivial pursuit. Not Jew is Gentile. And there were Gentile Christ believers, which means they were not Jewish. They hadn't been raised in that tradition. They might have been pagan. They might have been following Greek mythology. They might have been agnostic. They might have been atheist. They could have been any of those things. But they hear about this man named Jesus. They hear what discipleship includes, and they decide they want to be a Christ follower. So the church in Rome is comprised of these Christ followers, but they have diverse backgrounds, diverse sort of core um, priorities and principles, and you bring them together in church and say, let's do life together. And do you know what happens? They fight a little bit because in their diversity, they had different rules about eating. They had different rules about daily living. They had different rules about cleanliness. They had different rules about women and men and children and elders and all of those things. They had all these differences that they brought to the table, and then they were coming together to do life together, and every once in a while they had trouble. And when their pastor couldn't solve their troubles, and they couldn't solve their troubles, they write to Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul started the church. He knows what he's doing, right? We'll ask Pastor Paul. So they send Pastor Paul a letter that we do not have. But that's how it worked, right? They say, Pastor Paul, we're struggling with this, 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 and this. And Pastor Paul writes a letter, which is... Romans as we know it, right? So we sometimes have to infer what the struggles were based on what his response is. It's trying to create a dialogue with only having half of it, but that's what we do. So the church in Rome is struggling, and clearly some of what they're struggling with is all the things that those people are doing. And it kind of looks like maybe these people in these pews 
are throwing stones at these people in these pews. Well, but they don't keep kosher. Well, but they don't do this. Well, they're so worried about the laws. Well, they're only worried about the relationship. They're just back and forth and back and forth, and they can't quite come to one accord. And so Paul then responds and says, let's, let's get clear about our starting place here. Yes, there are murderers and liars and malice people, you know, people full of malice and people who are hard-hearted and people who are greedy and people who are lustful, people who are angry, people who are unforgiving. And those people are us. You and you and you and you and you and, yep, before you all get too high and mighty, you and you and you and you and you, right? They are us and we are sinners. That is the starting place which is super cheery, I know, right? It's delightful. God says, you should preach on Romans. And I open up Romans 1 and I go, are you serious? <laughs> Who wants to be told that they're a sinner? <laughs> we don't go to those churches because we don't want to hear it. But our reality is we are sinners. So the starting place I want to make really clear is this. My name is Debbie and I am a sinner. And the proper response is, hi, Debbie, you are a sinner. It's an acknowledgement of the same because oftentimes in Christianity, we're sort of inclined to, to, to just sort of minimize. No, 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 you're, it's not that bad. You can't be that. You're not that kind of sinner, right? Well, Paul wants to be very clear. There is no that kind of sinner. You're either a sinner or you're not a sinner and pretty much you're just a sinner, so let's be real clear that that's our baseline, which means nobody's better than anybody else because we are all sinners. That's the exciting news today. You didn't walk into church. You didn't sign into church with a whole bunch of perfect people. You are at a church that is full of people who are disobedient and selfish and do their own thing. Praise God. If you found a perfect church, you should be just feeling those alarm bells going off in your whole system because nobody has it that right. And the perfect church is maybe just the church of just me because I'm okay with just me. It's when you add in all the rest of the people that we have trouble. Right? All right, so I want you to indulge me a little bit. I want you to turn to somebody next to you or across the pew or something like that. And I want you to introduce yourself. You may know each other for 40 years. That doesn't matter. I want you to say your name. I am a sinner. And I want your friend not to say, no, 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 it's not that bad. I want you to say, good morning. Yes, you are. Right? Can we do that? So I want you to indulge me. I want you to say hello. I want you to greet one another. If you're by yourself, hopefully somebody will come and find you and, and say good morning. Don't you feel better knowing you're not the only one? The secret is out. And the better news is there is forgiveness and there is grace for all of us. There is forgiveness and there is grace for all of us. And we're not going to actually get too far into that just yet. We will. We're trying to follow Romans and stick with the passage that we have each at a time, which means this week is a little bit heavy, and I promise they won't all be heavy like this. But it's important for us to recognize our starting place because if we don't acknowledge that we are sinful or that we have a problem, then we have no need for Christ. If we are not broken, we do not need redemption. If we are not sinful, we do not need saving. So Jesus doesn't matter 
if we have no problem with sin. Does that make sense? That's where Paul is going to take us, is, is not just that we're sort of collectively acknowledging that we're sinners. It's not just sort of humanizing one another. Those, those things are incredibly valuable. But for him, it's really what's at stake is the power of Christ. Jesus matters because we have an inherent problem in humanity and in our relationships. That's our starting place. And before we can receive the big gift of grace, we have to acknowledge that we need it. So this morning is about acknowledging our need for grace. And we're going to have a time of reflection and prayer and listening. This is just for you to be honest and real with God. And I have extra stones up here. If the stone analogy is helpful for you, you are welcome to take one. Um, I've got extras here on the altar. I'm happy to have you take them from my extra little bucket here. Um, Because sometimes it's nice to remember, I was ready to throw a stone, and I need to slow down. I need to remember that only the one who is without sin has the right to throw any stones, and he doesn't. It's not his way. It's not who he is. So I'm going to invite us to join together in the prayer of confession that comes from the United Methodist hymnal. It'll be on the screen for us. That's our starting place for just that then personal prayer, and Judy's going to then move into song. And what I want you to do is just reflect, and maybe you know where you've gotten it wrong this week or this month or this year or just this morning, right? There's time enough in a day for that. (laughs) Or maybe you're not sure. And so then I just want you to say, you know, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Convict me. What is it in me that I need to lay down? What is it that I need to see so that I might truly receive your gift of grace? So as we get started in this time, I would invite you to join me in prayer. There we go. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
After the prayer of confession in our liturgy comes the response. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We're not called to confess our sins, to feel terrible about ourselves. We are called to confess our sins so that we might receive the full gift of grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen.